All right, welcome everyone to Let's Talk Live. My name is Noelle and I will be moderating today's Let's Talk program. We love hearing from you around the world, so please use the sidebar chat in Zoom or the comments on social media to share where you're joining from. We ask that you invite others to join my OCN community. We are a welcoming community available any day, anytime, anywhere, and membership is always free. A few reminders just to be respectful and polite as always with the opinions of others in the comments and chat, but please do share your comments and questions. We have two guests today and you're welcome to share any questions that you have throughout the program. Again, you can use the comments on social media or the sidebar chat in Zoom. This is a live program. It's being shared on our MyOCN Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. And it is also being recorded, so it will be available on both of those platforms after the show, as well as on myocn.net. The Orthodox Christian Network is a 501c3 corporation and a 100% donor-supported ministry. So we're very grateful to all of you who support us. We rely on your donations to keep these programs running and free, and we ask that you remember OCN in your end-of-the-year giving. So with that, I will turn things over to Father Chris for our program. Thank you, Noel. Welcome, everyone. It's good to have you with us once again. We're almost at Christmas. It feels like we've been in Christmas mode for quite some time, but we're almost there. And God willing, we'll all have a glorious Christmas and a new year that's filled with God's presence. Tonight, we have two very special guests. Before we introduce them, I'm going to say a prayer, as I always do. I put my candle, my vote of candle. I encourage all of you to do that when we meet sort of as a small community, the MyOCN community worldwide, and we pray together. Heavenly King and Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, everywhere present, filling all things, the treasure of blessings and the giver of life. Come and dwell in us and cleanse us of every stain and save our souls, O gracious one. Christ lives and works through us. We are his conduits on this planet. Our life experience is our personal narrative continually evolving and continually growing into the best person that we can become. The episode this evening with Dr. Rossi becoming a healing presence is about sharing our experience of God in our lives. But before we go to Dr. Rossi, we have a very special guest tonight. Will be speaking to us about a program that's just begun or rather continued on through the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. His name is George Theodoridis. He is the master chanter at the St. Sophia Cathedral in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. I'm not going to read his very long and impressive bio. Uh, you can find that online because I want to go directly into the subject. George, welcome to the program. Hello, Father. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, George, you know, people may say, well, music is music. So what's the difference between European music, for example, and, and Byzantine music? Right. So Byzantine music, um, the term Byzantine is, is usually uh, referred to as something negative, but in this case, it represents something uh, imperial, something glorious. So Byzantine music is the ecclesiastical music of uh, mainly the Greek speaking part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, it is always performed a cappella, so no instruments, and it's also the natural evolution of the ancient Greek musical tradition, which uh, used the modal system of scales. Uh, as a music language, it uses its own notation, um, uh, also known as parasimandiki, which was originally devised during the 10th uh, century as a mnemonic aid to the oral tradition. Uh, then in 1814, the old notation was revised and replaced by the fully prescriptive new method uh, of Byzantine music. Now, the difference between Western music and Byzantine music would be um, that parasimandiki, uh, the notation system that I mentioned before, and Western staff notation um, is that uh, uh, while parasimandi, uh, while Western staff uh, indicates the uh, absolute. Uh, the absolute pitch of each note on the staff, parasimandiki, indicates the interval of and, and quality of execution of a note. So you see one thing, but you have to think ahead three things. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and then finally, the intervals between uh, notes are determined by the genre uh, and the mode uh, to which a composition belongs. So are we talking about 
something just for the so-called Greeks, the Greek Orthodox Church, or from what you're explaining that this is part of the Orthodox Church, part of the history of our church? Yes, absolutely. So it is true that uh, originally, uh, as I said, an evolution of the ancient Greek uh, uh, music system, uh, the ecclesiastical music was uh, uh, based upon the Greek original text. However, in, in recent years, and when I say recent, even more than 20 years now, there have been uh, certain um, uh, projects to translate the ecclesiastical text, which means in, in, in several languages. And the beautiful thing about Byzantine music is that you can easily adapt any text with Byzantine music the same way that you write uh, a music composition uh, in, in Western staff. Mm -hmm. So here in America, especially, we have a great platform of translations that are metered. I've heard you chant in both Greek and in English. And uh, frankly, it, it's really, I spent, as you know, Holy Week with you there and Father Stephen and Father Dimitri then. Uh, and it was uh, something to behold and listen to. It really was fantastic. Let me get, because we don't have a lot of time. Let me get to the issue of uh, you were elevated as the Archon Music Instructor in June for the School of Music at the Archdiocese by His Eminence, Archbishop Elpidophoros. Tell us about ASBM, Archdiocesan School of Byzantine Music. Malista. Uh, the ASBM, the Archdiocesan School of Byzantine Music is um, an official ministry of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese that educates and develops competent cantors in the Celtic art, to wrap it up. It started some 10 years ago uh, under former Archbishop Dimitrios, uh, Yeron of America, uh, by initiative of Father Pandeleimon Papadopoulos, the former archdeacon. Uh, now, when His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros reached out to me, uh, he wanted to use that precious foundation that um, these uh, gentlemen initiated and reimagine the school. So make it more than just a school for hobbyists or for musicologists. Uh, so since uh, August of uh, this year, through the generous financial assistance and support of Leadership 100, we're working uh, to enrich our sacred archdiocese and the Greek Orthodox Church of, uh, of America with capable and well-trained cantors to enhance our worship experience, such as you experienced at St. Sophia. Well, there's nothing more beautiful than a service within the Orthodox Church, as you know. Uh, we know that Orthodoxy, when you walk into the church, it, it literally bombards your senses. Those senses are the entrance into the soul, as we know. Now, that can either be a nice entrance and a beautiful entrance and a glorifying entrance, or it can be a miserable experience where it is not in any way in sync and that really can destroy what we do. So tell us if, if someone is interested, I, tell us about first about the professors you're utilizing, and then finally, how does someone get involved? How can they enroll in this school? Sure, uh, first of all, the ASBM consists of uh, expert instructors who are also experienced cantors or psaltists as we know them. And they all hold either a degree or or a certificate in Byzantine music. Uh, these instructors provide courses based on, but not limited to an academic curriculum that was created by Father Romanos Karanos, the professor of Byzantine musicology of, uh, at Holy Cross Hellenic College and spiritual advisor also of the ASBM. So through that curriculum and uh, an innovative virtual learning program that we have created, the ASBM is designed to uh, meet the various needs of, of its students, regardless of their knowledge uh, in the Greek language uh, or regardless of any musical background at all. Mm -hmm. And if they want to uh, tell us about, is there a website they can go to to register? Yes, sure. When is this, and when does the program start? So the program uh, starts uh, on, uh, registration has started already. Uh, and uh, it will be completed on January 1st. And then on January 3rd, we will start our classes. We have already uh, a lot of applicants and we're trying to facilitate uh, all this uh, amount of people to the right instructor. And uh, 
if I may, um, I wanted to um, give you a little bit <clears throat> to uh, toot our own horn, if you want, uh, because I understand that there are several other institutions uh, in the United States that uh, might teach Byzantine music either for free or uh, through through payment. And um, although there are there are other avenues available to learn uh, to chant, uh, uh, it is it is a total different ball game, if I may use that that term. And so some instructors offer free lessons, while others invest much time and resources that reasonably uh, reasonably require some financial coverage. Okay. Um, with a few exceptions, all of these other instructors, uh, in my experience, do not possess the, the, the knowledge beyond and above uh, what one can characterize as elementary. Uh, so these other uh, instructors or, or institutions may have uh, listened to tapes, cassettes, CDs, YouTube videos, even for many years, or, or even uh, have been trained over the summer by a Greek psalty, but at the end of the day, uh, the ASBM aims to fashion st uh, students and create masters. So create uh, experts through experts. All right. Well, look, George, we thank you for coming on the program. We are uh, very much excited about this endeavor of the Archdiocese with the blessing of Archbishop Abidophoros and, of course, with your capable direction. Uh, Father Caranos, of course, again, is a former co-worker of mine at Helena College Holy Cross, very dedicated individual, completely dedicated to the faith. Uh, we wish you the best. We urge those who are listening to please go to the website. What is the website, George? The website would be uh, asbm.goarch.org. That's asbm.goarch.org. dot o r g. Very and uh, register and find out uh, everything about the program. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we wish you a blessed Christmas. You're, you're welcome to stay on if you want, but if you need to go elsewhere, we know how busy you are. But thank you, George. God bless thank you. Thank you, Father. We actually have another meeting outside going on right now. So Go for it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Let's thank you. To our next guest, uh, Dr. Christmas. Albert Rossi, is... Uh, what can I say about Dr. Al? Dr. Al is an incredible individual. He's been with us many times, but I'm gonna read his uh, sort of professional bio because I think it's important for us to put some bookends around who is the Dr. Albert Rossi. Uh, Dr. Rossi teaches and serves as the resident clinical psychologist at St. Vladimir Seminary. He has served and continues as a member on the faculty for 28 years. He has written numerous articles on psychology and religion he wrote two books, Becoming a Healing Presence and All is Well. After teaching at Pace University for 24 years, he retired as Associate Professor of Psychology, is a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of New York. Dr. Rossi, always a pleasure to have you with us. Brother Chris, it's great for me to be here. It's a total joy. And this is my fourth time in this series, Becoming a Healing Presence. So <clears throat> I'm pumped. I'm very glad to be here and very glad to see all the people on the screen right now. We're all doing the same thing in this one hour of our lives. We're trying to become a little more ourselves, our best self, our Christ in us. I live now, not I, but Christ lives in us. And we need each other. <laughs> so in this time that I have, please feel free to make it interactive. Put up your hand to say something, blurt it out, ask a question, make a comment, throw a tomato, whatever it might be, and or chat, and we'll talk. Okay. That said, let's jump in, please. All right. Let me, uh, let me start with a, a first question for you. Uh, you say we all want to be noble, elated, above earth bound ourselves. What does that mean? I wish I knew fully. <laughs> what I do know is that it's a claim that I consider valid, <clears throat> true for all of us. And if we simply look back upon our lives, we can ask the question, is there a time now that I can look back upon and know that mm, whatever I did was beyond my usual self 
was more than my earthbound, sometimes heavier mm, body and soul, and was really quite mm, noble. And all of us, I think, can look back on something we did that way, and we'd like to do more of it. <clears throat> and and what it really, and during that, that time, whatever it happens to be, then um, we can see the dimension of love in it. Mm -hmm. In my own case, did I ever do something noble and above myself? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I gave a talk in Pittsburgh for the young adult conference there. 300 young adults, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful youth. We had a great time. Um, and I know that I stretched myself and drove to Pittsburgh and, and did it. And it was noble and they said so. Um, and that was above my usual dumpy self. I live alone. I love it. My wife is dead. But that's the call. The call, and that's why we're on this program. And I'll try to little, do a little bit about how we do that. But we want to be that self. A love, because when we are in a mode of love, which might be constricted and with parameters, we're, God, is, God is love. God is going through us. Yeah, yeah. Well, the last time we met, you asked us to personally answer this question. What is the one time that I can now see God touching my life? Would you like to continue that discussion? Yes, yes. I'd like to, and I'd like it to be interactive. That is, I'd like people on the screen to share a time now they see God's hand in their life then. Okay. I'll share one and begin it. But I think this is really important because the more we conceptualize our past in terms of God's handiwork and God's hand however we would say it, coming down through the cloud or out through our hearts, then the more we are poised, habituated to see God's presence in our life now and the near future. So one time um, when I was engaged to my wife, engaged to my fiance then, I recall exactly the scene. I was a high school guidance counselor. I was content. School in New Jersey near the shore, tenure, they couldn't touch me, big school, five guidance counselors, many teachers in the school that say to me, Al, when you leave, there's nothing in your hands. When you come in in the morning, there's nothing in your hands. When we leave as teachers, we have two bags and a backpack full of books and tests that we're going to prepare and spend the evening and the morning. We come in in the morning, same thing, two backpacks all day long. You sit in your office with a leather chair you see students one-on-one -on -one drinking a cup of coffee. We're in a room with 25 savages, and you get the same pay we do. I say, you got that right. So there were teachers in the school, going to school at night, Montclair State and so on, studying guidance counseling, hoping I would die, and then they could become a high school guidance counselor. My wife, fiance then, looked me in the eye, and she said, Al, you're too good to be a high school guidance counselor. Go quit, go on, get a doctorate in psychology. I'm a nurse, I'll put you through. And then you can be a clinical psychologist. I looked her right in the eye. I said, woman, are you crazy? I have everything a guy could want. And you're telling me quit? She said, yeah. Well, she didn't even say take a leave of absence, just quit. I quit and spent the whole year in New York City, New School for Social Research, studying psychology to take the exam to try to get into a doctoral psychology course, which is quite difficult. Did, came out the other side, here I am. That was God's hand through her voice, getting me to be on this screen with you now and not a tenured high school guidance counselor with a cushy job. So I have many like that in my own life. I'd like to hear from others. Last time, Father Chris, we heard from you, we heard from Noel. Father Chris, you call on somebody, please. Or is anybody willing to put up your hand and say, I can see now there was some time in my life, in my past, when God's world was, was clearly working. Well, it's, a, it's not an intimidating question. It's just something that you look at your life and, you know, say, okay, well, God was here or God wasn't there. Uh, yeah. Anyone want to raise their hand? Okay, uh, Athena. Hi. Um, the 
I guess it was about 15 years ago, I was living in Kauai and I had a really good life. I had a home, I was raising my daughter and I really felt that God was calling me back to go back to California where I was born. And it was just one of those times when I really, I don't know, I was really just obedient. I don't know what other word, cause I didn't want to leave. Um, that was Kauai, you're talking like Hawaii, right? In Hawaii, yeah. My gosh, okay. And so I was like, okay, I got back to California. I prayed again. God said, now I want you to sell your house. I said, oh, okay, okay. All right. But what's it's nice to talk about it because what's interesting is I don't know that I can remember a time like Dr. Rossi was saying when I really just was completely like, obedient there was no question it was just so this is what you have to do and i did it and it you know it turned out that i really needed to be in california it was absolutely crucial um through the grace of god because we almost lost i didn't know my mom was in financial ruin we almost lost everything but through god's grace and my hard work we were able to save our livelihood. And I didn't know, of course, I didn't know my mom was going to die five years later. So I got that those years with her too. So it was, and I was able to provide for my family um, because I was a single mom too. So it was amazing to see how God worked. I mean, there were times when we were in foreclosure, we had no money and, you know, how things were, there were miracles, financial miracles happening, just money showing up to pay the mortgage and then people showing up to help us refinance. And it was, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Rossi, do you want to say anything? No, I love this. But I love the fact that in this grouping, it is a community and we are learning from each other. And when I hear Athena talking about the time God works in her life, that brightens my, my 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 cranium to be a little more alert to looking at some other things in my life that I can now newly because of her see God's handiwork and therefore see the near future clearer in terms of God. So Chris, continue with you please with another share or two. Anyone else would like to share? I can I can pick up some people. I see someone who had a God's hand in his life, but I, I want to see if he's going to raise his hand first. We visited the Dead Sea together, and he almost drowned. Oh. And that would be Tony. Tony, you want to share that story? You'd have to unmute, Tony. Tony, we can hear you. There we are. There you go, Tony. It's Tony Irene. Tony. But uh, we, were, we were all over there together with 48 people. Someone needs to take it. Right, Go ahead, John. in Jerusalem, we went there, we had a wonderful time, and Father Chris took us one day to the Dead Sea. Well, I was an old guy, I mean, I still am, but, but when we got there, he said, you know, he says, it's a little chilly out there, and it's raining, and I don't recommend that any of you people, people go into the water. But at the time, I was 85 years old. I had never been to Jerusalem. I said, here's my one opportunity to go ahead and swim in the Dead Sea. I had a neighbor who told me, though, make sure when you're in the water, don't put your head directly in the water. You're going to have trouble for a couple of days seeing. He said, I'm all right. So I went out, had a beautiful float. On, on my back, my head was out of the water. And I said, well, this has been good. Now I better go ahead and get myself upright so I can get back to the shore. And I tried to get in, I couldn't put my feet down. I mean, it's so buoyant, you have no, no control over that, unless you flip over, put your head in the water, which he told me, and she was a good Jewish girl too. She said, don't put your head in. So I didn't. But fortunately, we had Constance, who was right next to me. We were the two that broke, that broke the law and went in to swim. 
and uh, Constance is Father <laughs> Father Chris's daughter. <laughs> So she was standing there right next to me. And I'm too, so I, I grabbed her around the head. <laughs> and I could, I could feel later that maybe that sort of uh, upset. But I had that feeling. And I was waiting to make sure that everything was OK. And you know, I had my, my life in God's hand at that time. But he pulled me through. Father Chris, may I add? Yes. He was a former lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And was, that was his story. And he was a tremendous swimmer, and Constance is a trained lifeguard. And again, Dr. Ross, you speak about God being in places. I mean, why was Constance there? Um, you know, to save Tony, I think. But thanks for, thanks for sharing that. But I remember that story always. It's a great story. Others? Let's do one more, please. Okay. Anyone else? Don't be shy. You may not have a, uh, you know, a floating in the Dead Sea story or a moving from Hawaii story, but I'm sure you have some kind of story that you can share. <clears throat> Anyone else raising their hands, Noel, that you see? We could pick on someone. That's always fun. Let's see. Uh, let's see, we have a couple of screens here. Uh, how about Amanda Jacobs? Amanda, do you have anything that you could share with us? You'd have to unmute yourself. Let's see if she's there. Sorry, I'm going in the other room. I have my children in the, the background. Okay. Um, so I, and they're having a lot of fun. So I didn't want to be distracting. So that's why I, one of the reasons I didn't raise my hand. Um, wow. I think the biggest one was I was working in a private school, um, teaching and everyone kept pushing me to, um, join this website. Cause I was one of the only single teachers. Um, and they jokingly would say, you know, you're getting kind of old for, um, us and you should get married soon. Um, and I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, just cause I just started my teaching career and they kept forwarding me these um, emails to check out this uh, Christian dating website. And um, one day my friend had come and met me um, after work. And so one of them had told my friend about it who was very much interested in um, getting married and um, having kids. And so she said, oh, I'll do it with her. And she actually um, signed us both up and um, Long story short, through that website, I ended up meeting my husband. Sure. Um, and we're so happily married and we have twins. And um, he introduced me to the Orthodox faith. And I can see even just from that one, um, that one event, how with that and through my husband, how God continues to um, bless us. And um, how sometimes my stubbornness gets in the way, but God always has something better than I could ever imagine. So. That's, great. That's my story. Thanks, Amanda. Uh -huh. Dr. Rossi? Yes, thank you, Father Chris. I'll now go to my website, if you don't mind, <clears throat> and do as I've done the last couple of times, say some things. <clears throat> the title of these five sessions is Becoming a Healing Presence. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to do. And when we are a healing presence and we know it, that's when we are our noble, elevated, beyond earthbound sense. My wife, who is in heaven and has been for, for a while, her zip code is heavenly, wants to sing, seek ye first. So here she is. I would ask us on the screen, close our eyes and let her in heaven, which means in our hearts, sing directly to us.
And she is the better part of, she always works through me and is part of this. I'm not gonna just put on the screen, we don't have to discuss it, but a quote from E.E. E. Cummings, it takes courage to grow up. And I'm 84 and still growing up. I'm at the beginning of that continuum. It takes courage to grow up and become who you really are. It's a very powerful um, statement. I, I deal with a group of bishops and we discuss this. And we all agree that who we really are is our best self, the elevated beyond uh, earthly, earthbound self. Christ in me is who I and you really are. I live now, not I, but Christ lives in me. And it was agreed that the word courage, pivotal, means some acceptance of our crosses. I have crosses, you have crosses. And then the question is, how do, what's our attitude toward them? Freedom consists in choosing to cultivate the light better self and me, or choosing to cultivate the dark self and me, which we do by, by missing the mark by sinning. When we freely choose the light self, we release energy. When we choose the dark self, which we do sometimes, judgmentalism or anger or envy or whatever it is, when we choose the dark self, that constricts the energy in us. That's the light self. Stable, reasonably joy-filled, and the candle for our purposes is the, is the light of Christ, illumining us. And that's when we are our best selves. Now that happens to be a photo of one of my favorite little human beings, Lucia, and that's my daughter in Italy helping her. My daughter was in Italy for 15 months with a large program, Jean Vanier's group, and they had adult autistic and learning disabled uh, um, special needs infants. So my daughter was in charge of Lucia. That's who, whom I really want to be and who you really want to be. Now, needless to say, that's not my daughter all the time. Of course, she has three kids, etc. But we can be elevated by staying close to Christ. The other side of us, Satan exists and is trying to own my soul and yours. He's cunning, baffling, and powerful, tempts me through my dark side. And that's the same girl, <sighs> having blown out the candle, we can leave Christ, he doesn't leave us, and we can sometimes be as she looks, forlorn and glum and not joyful. And that's often the way we can look, huh? estranged from other people, family or friends or anyone, at least for a moment. It's no sin to have ugly, scummy thoughts. Nope. Some of this is review from previous times. Those thoughts are temptations through my dark side. And if I choose to entertain them, I sin. I miss the mark. If I continue to obsess about other people's difficulties, that's missing the mark. Beautiful photo of a young, of a girl at Antiochian Village, sort of illustrating for us, we, she, we, what they hit the center of the, the bullseye. Same girl. Notice that she's disciplined. Elbow is up. Arrow is straight, eye on the goal. She's likely to hit the mark. So are we, if we stay closer to Christ. So when I'm aware of my dark, ugly thoughts, I can turn to the Lord with a Jesus prayer or simply Lord have mercy. That's the way we expand our elevated self. I must admit, I say Lord have mercy. Oh, it seems like a zillion times a day because I'm just aware of how much how lowly I am and how much I need mercy. Life is a constant, unseen warfare. I mean, it just is. I may like that, I may not, but that's for everybody. So at every breath, I can choose to live 
out, either my, of either self and me. The question is, which self do I want to become a healing presence? So I don't want to just blah, 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 blah. Father Chris, do you want to? Yeah, I think Dr. Rossi, the, the next question that, that I'd like to go is you, you mentioned the term and, and folks, you can uh, post in the chat room any questions you have for Dr. Rossi. And those of you on social media, you can work with Noel and I'm sure that we can hear. Noel, do we have anything posted at this point that you can see? Okay. So we'll just go on. Uh, Dr. Rossi, you use the term active listening. Uh, that's got to be a part of hitting the mark, I'm sure. Could you explain a little more about what you mean about active listening? Yes, I'd love to. And I'll spend more time next time, my fifth and last session on active listening, trying even to be a little more active, more interactive with it. For our purposes at this moment, active listening means that I say, not only here with my ears, but something comes out my mouth, I say a sentence, a declarative sentence, short, which tells you, I heard you. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Much of the time when we're one-on-one -on -one with someone and the other person is speaking, our mind is on what I'm going to say, <laughs> what, what, what's going to be my response, as opposed to simply listening to the other person, yes. letting the other person know I listen. So I define active listening as love delivered. And of course, I teach that at St. Vladimir's. Active listening is love delivered. And I would say... <clears throat> in our culture and in the Orthodox Church, active listening is in short supply. So why I'm why do you think that is? I mean, is it because we're in such a fast society that we feel we have to you know, complete people's sentences, complete their thoughts, we're so busy? I mean, you're, you're so right. It's a, active listening is so important. If you don't hear what the person says, how can you respond? How can I respond? And next week I'll get into much more some of the nuts and bolts of all that, because it is. But for your question, why is it? An, I'm a clinical psychologist. I had a, an office in downtown Manhattan, New York City. I saw rich and poor, tall and short, men and women. Virtually everyone who came, you know, I'd say, okay, you've been recommended to me. What can I do for you? Virtually everyone would say, Doc, I don't have much peace. I'm not at peace. I don't have much peace. So I know that the basic reason for that is not knowing God because we're made in God's image and likeness. And if we don't know him, we don't know ourselves. And we, we, we find that through silence and through, through love. So I'd spend the better part of an hour with that person almost always person would say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And most of the time I spent listening. Right now I'm the clinical psychologist at St. Vladimir Seminary. I saw two, two this afternoon, two women, one the wife of a seminarian and one who works at St. Vladimir's, spend most of my time listening. That's what Father Hopko said in his 55 Maxims and in his own life said that really the job of the priest the job of the human is to listen to other people and let them know that we've heard them yep. because that is the way we can support them. So when I say it's in short supply, when I listen to someone in orthodoxy, they're like, oh man, this is really, really good. Like it's new. It's like I found this here and I haven't found it uh, any place else. And we, and, but now I teach it and so on. And we have to also know that, and it means about loving we humans really, we aren't too good at loving. It means being like God. So my daughter will sometimes say to me, dad, you're not listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. I mean, my wife would say it all the time. She's in heaven. So that's the short answer to, to, to what you're asking. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I had a, a person come into me here in the parish where I'm serving as an interim pastor in San Jose, California this year. And uh, she said, Father, you know, I just need somebody to listen to me. 
everybody I just need me. somebody to listen to me. Just listen to me, you know? And I said, whoa, that wow. was, a, you know, talk about a salvo across the bow of a ship. I mean, yeah. that is the essence, the crux of what it is. Yeah. And I think the crux of our problems in our families, our relationships, in the church itself, Yes. People actually step back and are not so interested in what they think, but let me hear what's in the heart and the soul of this person. I think you, you hit it right on the head. Yeah. And that's true up and down the line. For example, I have five grandchildren and I intentionally listen to them as best I can. And boy, they respond in a way. For example, I was with both my children and their families at Thanksgiving in Jacksonville, Florida. And we had a fine time, three days. There was not a dark cloud spoken by any one of us, wow. nine of us, the whole time. It was amazing. Unlike my own childhood when I grew up, Italian family. The, but at the airport, my son and his wife and their two little boys were there. And the two-year-old kept saying over and over, I want to go home with Papa. I want to be with Papa. I want to be in the plane. And I knew in some part it's because I related to him on his level by listening to him and could in some way communicate that to a little two-year-old. Yeah. So yeah. true, so true. Uh, Noel, do you have any uh, questions that you want to put forward? Mm, uh, not yet. Okay, I have one more and with this one, we can probably finish the program. Um, you say, Dr. Rossi, a simple smile can accomplish much. Can you expand on that? Because someone might say to us, ah, oh, that's just too simplistic. Yep. That's a direct quote from Mother Teresa, who said exactly that. That's why I wrote it, because <laughs> she said it. That we, we really don't know, cannot know the power of a simple smile. One of the things to say about that is there are a number of psychology studies on smiling and its effect that when we smile, of course, we change the facial muscles, which then change the neurons up in our brain and come back down, that that act of smiling changes the neurons basically in our beta endorphin system. And that act makes us incrementally more happy than we were before we smiled. And they have a whole bunch of studies of students, don't smile, smile, and so on. They also have studies on the actual neurons themselves. And they've shown that when a person smiles at someone, the other person's neurons in the area with much of the beta endorphins, that the other person changes as well because of our smile and nothing else. And the other person becomes a little changed in a positive, happy direction. So when we just smile, and when I say smile, <laughs> I mean, I live alone, I love it, but I try as best I can to have a smile on my face when alone as much as I can all day long. You know what? That changes my day because somehow I'm not thinking about, oh, 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 all the 800,000 died of, in the United States of COVID. Oh, no, I'm smiling because I have all as well at that moment of the smile. I also smile behind my mask. Now, I don't think people can see that, though I suspect they can see the twinkle in my eye and I can see the twinkle in their eye. There's a great deal to communicate and say, and it's easy enough, just to smile. Father Schmemann often said, quoting Nietzsche, the problem with Christians, they have no joy. Uh, well, Meaning, well. they don't smile very much. There's not much evident joy we're communicating one way, not the only way, but one way, is through a smile. Mm -hmm. You know, is it possible for a Christian to be a moody person? Is it possible for a Christian to be an unhappy person? I guess it's possible because things happen in life and they bring us down. But in the essence, in the spinal column, if you will, of who we are, there's no way you could be moody. There's no way you could be without joy. I, I give an example. I was watching television last week when the tornadoes hit the Midwest and watched the incredible devastation. I mean, there was one capital that the, the top of the couple or the top of the capital was off and the building was just sitting there. 
Uh, people were sitting in folding chairs in front of their homes with Coleman stoves. And I said, I got so down, I got so depressed. And then I started seeing, because I go through like five, six different channels and watch. And then I started seeing the first responders come in the second day with food on the trucks and getting out of the trucks and helping people find. So I said, okay, there you go. There you go. There is Christ in there. There's that smile we've all been looking for. That's right. I think we've got a hand up and it looks like Maria. Maria, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? I, I just wanted to thank Dr. Rossi for documenting his journey and his wife's journey in his book. It has been um, wonderful to get it, to get to hear you. I feel like I know you from your book and I, I believe I've benefited very much. And I think um, coming back, circling back to what Father uh, Christopher just said about um, Christians showing our joy. There, there's so many times that we get bogged down with so many things, concerns, going deep, um, that we forget that that joy is what we are, that that joy is what attracts other people to Christ. Absolutely. And that we need to be reflecting his light. And I'm speaking to myself when I'm saying this, because in the Christmas season, when we're running to do so many things, sometimes we forget that it is about the joy to the world and not just all of the world. That Thank you. Is. Thank you. And, and with, that, with that beautiful sentence, we will end our program today with Dr. Rossi, but it won't be the last time that we'll have this wonderful individual with us. Uh, we urge you to encourage others to join us the next time he's on and to go to the website if you've missed anything tonight and you want to replay it so you can hear it again. Uh, we'll do that. Dr. Rossi, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Father Chris. It was a joy, total joy. We'll say a prayer and then Noel and I have a few things that are closing remarks and we'll go over some of the scheduling that's coming up. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Amen. Noel, I know you've been busy up there in Washington, D.C. What can we share? Uh, so I'll say, first of all, that we will have a little bit of odd scheduling for the rest of this month because of the holidays. So please do check the calendar for upcoming programs. Uh, we'll continue to update that to make sure that all the programs that are going forward as scheduled are marked and anything you don't see on the calendar is, uh, is not happening. Um, if it's helpful, I can put a cancellation notice there too. But um, just so that you know, we will have most of our programs going forward um, as usual, but between Christmas and New Year's, there will be a little bit of um, a break. And then I'll also just say a little plug for our newest programs, which are the programs out of Ascension, Ascension Cathedral in Oakland. We've got three new programs, two are weekly, one is every other week. We've got two Bible studies on Tuesday and Sunday, and then we've got a bi-weekly program on Wednesdays on the Divine Liturgy. So those programs are streaming live on our social media, and you can also get a Zoom link for those now on our website, myocn.net, along with information about all of the other upcoming programs. Okay. Um, anything else you wanted me to touch on, Father? No, that's about it. And that's about it. We want to wish everyone a peaceful run up to Christmas. Don't drive yourselves absolutely bananas. Take a step back. Smile at the people you meet. I love, I mean, Dr. Ross, I can't tell you how many times I wear this God blessed mask and I see people and I'm smiling and I'm saying, ah, do they know I'm smiling at them. I don't know if they know that, but I feel so good when I do that. So don't stop smiling. Be serious about your walk, continue your fast. And as we reach the nativity of our Lord, may that same Lord enter your homes and give you peace and give you strength in the days ahead. God bless you all. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you, Father Chris.